So I have to, I have to begin by boasting a little bit, okay? So this past week, my son's hockey team had a parent versus kids hockey game. And there's two ways that you can approach this. The one way is that you can say, well, they're a bunch of kids. We could go easy on them. Or you could just crush them with an iron fist. <laughs> and I am, I am pleased to say that we crushed them with an iron fist. <laughs> with an over, yes, thank you, Gavin. With an overwhelming victory of 18 to 6. Although we did have to kind of, yes, yes, thank you. We did have to kind of lay off a little bit at the end because they're just going into playoffs and we didn't want to like completely ruin their spirits. But. And I, I have to say, lighting up a bunch of 10-year-olds should not feel as good as that felt. But it felt really, really good. And, you know, it, it just it feels good to be on the winning side, doesn't it? It feels good to have a victory, even if it is just over a bunch of 10-year-olds. And... Uh, you know, like twice their side. Caleb kept trying to like smash me with his stick and I didn't even, even feel it. It was like a little twig that was breaking off. No, we didn't drop the gloves and fight, but we should have. It would have been, it would have been good. But you know what? Caleb, Caleb didn't learn his lesson because we were going back to the car and, I, and I, was, I was jabbing him a little bit. I said, hey, how did it feel to get beat by your old man? And, and he said, well, you didn't beat me. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? We, we, we destroyed you guys. He's like, yeah, but you didn't. You played terrible. <laughs> So regardless of how well I played, it sure felt good to win. But you know what? It, it, is this not so often how the world works, where the strong and the powerful uh, overwhelm and overtake the weak? Right? The, the strong enact injustice on the weak. Those that have take more. The rich and powerful get more rich and powerful and rule the world. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, as the familiar expression goes. Yet, as we discovered last week, the cross is a paradox. When we look at the, the, the cross of Jesus, it's nothing less than the complete reversal of all of the world's values and the way that things work. It's a complete subversion of the world by its own Methods. Now, if you don't know what that word subvert or subversion mean, that's okay, but it's a good word, and I'm going to try to add it to your vocabulary this morning. To subvert means to overthrow from the foundation, to get right down to the very base, the very root of things, and just completely upset it. I, I, uh, to dismantle from the inside out. And the moment of Jesus' glory would not be on the victor's podium, but the hour of his humiliation and death. The cross is the victory of God. And if you weren't here last week, I want to give you a little bit of a, a recap. And we're looking at John chapter 12, where Jesus gives his last public monologue before he would be crucified. And so Jesus is, is, is talking to the crowds and, and talking about his own death, he uses the, this imagery. He says, unless a, a single kernel of wheat dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces a plentiful harvest, a harvest of new lives. And so Jesus is talking about his death, and he's saying, look, I am, I am going to die, but yet in my death, life will come out of it. And Jesus also challenges us to follow in his footsteps. He says, if you love your life in this world, you will lose it. And that's where we, we ended up last week. This week we're going to be starting at verse 27. Jesus says this, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Now, if you remember from last week, this hour in the Gospel of John, Jesus constantly refers to as the hour of his death. So, so my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. 
When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder, while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told them, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowd responded, we understand from Scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say that the Son of Man will die? Just who is the Son of Man anyway? Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. See, when we think about Jesus, and we think about his nature, we often make one of two mistakes. The first mistake that we often make is that we overemphasize his humanity and we reject his divinity. You know, maybe you're here and you've, you've heard about Jesus and you, you believe that Jesus is a historical figure. He had a lot of good things to say. He was a great moral teacher, but you're not sure how you feel about the divinity of Jesus. But then there's also a flip side of this as well, where we can overemphasize the divinity of Jesus at the expense of his humanity. And when we look at the things that Jesus did and, and, and we, we say to ourselves, man, it, well, you know, it was easier because he was, he was God, right? It, it must have been easier for him. Now, I, have not, I cannot claim to be fully God and fully man, so I don't know what it was like to be Jesus. But what I do know is that Jesus reveals the fullness of his humanity in this passage, he, what does he say in, in verse 27 here again? He says, now my soul is deeply troubled. Jesus knows what is coming. He knows that he has to die a brutal death of crucifixion. And, 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 and he's, he's struggling. And he's struggling with, over this agonizing, over this decision to do what he has just told us to do. To hate his life in this world. See, Jesus was tempted more than once to seek his own glory. But what does he say again in verse 28? He says, Father, bring glory to your name. Jesus would go to the cross and taste death out of obedience for and in the pursuit of glory for the Father. Because Jesus' glory was found in giving his glory away to the Father. And this relationship is confirmed in that moment, in this private conversation between Jesus and the Father. And they have this dialogue of, of, of giving uh, how God gets glory from Jesus and Jesus gives glory to God. And the crowd can't hear or understand what is happening, but there's this relational connection. Because the words were veiled from them. However, we get to hear the inside of the conversation. And we can see that the Father is brought, glory, brought to glory through Jesus. And he will again be glorified in his death. So the cross would bring glory to the Father because the defeat of the Son of Man would be the victory of God. And so I want to talk this morning about this paradox of victory and defeat. And there are a few ways in the cross where we see Jesus reign victorious, where we see God reign victorious in the midst of defeat. And the first one is victory over evil. You know, it's, it's the age-old question, how could a good God allow evil to exist? It's probably a question that you have struggled with. It's a question that I've asked. I know um, it's, a, it's a deeply human question question. If God is real, if God is truly loving, if God is out there, why does God allow evil things and evil people to seem to go around unchecked? Well, in John 12, 31, Jesus says this, the time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. The time or the hour for judging the world has come. But here's the, the really interesting thing, is that later in his monologue, 
Jesus would actually say that he didn't come to judge the world. In, in, tw- in chapter 12, verse 47, he says, I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me, for I have come to save the world and not to judge it. So we have to ask ourselves, okay, Jesus, which is it? Did you come to judge the world or did you come to save the world? The cross is the place of judgment because the cross is the place of decision. It is the place of belief or unbelief, of acceptance or rejection. In effect, it's at the cross where we bring judgment on ourselves. The strong fist of Rome's political power and its military might, the full force of of the Jewish religious agenda brought judgment on Jesus, or so they thought. But in reality, it was they who were being judged. And Jesus goes on to say that Satan, the ruler of the world, will be cast out. Now, this is a really fascinating phrase because a careful reader of the Gospels will recognize something as they go through the four eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. You open up the Bible and you read through Matthew and you see Jesus demonstrating his authority over the evil powers and the demonic powers of this world by casting out demons, by performing exorcisms. And so you, you read that in the Gospel of Matthew and you're like, oh, that's really interesting. And then you go to Mark And Mark is all about the kingdom of heaven. And so there are a lot of exorcisms in Mark. There's a lot of Jesus uh, demonstrating his power and authority over the spiritual forces of this world. And you get to Luke and you find the same thing happening. And then you get to John and there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. And so why, why does John exclude all of those events that happened. Well, the reason that I've come to believe and many commentators believe is that John wants the full weight of Jesus' words here to make its impact. That the ultimate casting out, the ultimate victory over all of the forces of evil, I'm talking about evil with a capital E here, over, over the entire demonic realm is at the cross. Jesus would not cast out mere demons, but the ruler of this world, Satan himself, on the cross. The final victory over all the powers of darkness, the moment of Jesus' glory, the day of reckoning, was on the cross. Jesus didn't defeat evil by waging a war, by letting, but instead by letting evil do its worst to him. He did not overcome evil with evil, but he overcame evil with good. And evil thought it had won. They crucified Jesus, and he he died on that cross. But there's a reason we call it Good Friday. We call it Good Friday because it's the day that Satan was dethroned and Jesus was enthroned. The serpent who ensnared humanity into slavery of sin has been cast out. And so, to answer the question, how could a good God allow evil to go unchecked? The answer is, he hasn't. There's a, there's a story that I love where uh, someone was reading in the Bible, in, in the book of Revelation, where it, it talks about Jesus' second coming, on the, the day of judgment, when, when Jesus comes back again, that he's going to cry out. And so, someone was reading that, and they were perplexed about it, and they went to the missionary in their village, and they asked him, like, what does this mean? Like, well, like what, is, what is Jesus going to cry? Well, like, what do you think he's going to cry out? Because it doesn't tell us what Jesus is going to cry out, just that he's going to. And the missionary thought for a second and, and pondered it. And then he said, you know what? I think that Jesus is going to cry enough. Enough pain, enough heartache, enough evil, enough. Jesus will cry enough. And the cross is the moment of judgment. The cross tells us that one day Jesus will finally say, enough. Because it was at the cross that Satan, the ruler, the would-be ruler of this world, is cast out. So we see that Jesus has victory over evil, but also 
over the evil in our hearts. Victory over sin. Because for anyone who will follow Jesus, you have to recognize that we have been infected with a disease, with a sickness called sin, with, with evil intent. The Bible says that the, the heart is, is evil. Who, who can understand it? In John 12, 32a, the first little bit there, Jesus says, and when I'm lifted up from the earth, and I just want to, I want to stop there for a second. I want to talk about this phrase, lifted up. It's a very ambiguous phrase, and it's an ambiguous phrase on purpose, and it carries with it a very rich meaning. To the people of the day, it was obviously referred to crucifixion. Crucifixion was a very common practice in ancient Rome, and particularly in Israel, because they, they wanted to quell out any sort of zealotry, any sort of um, insurrection that would happen. And so what they would do is they would crucify people. If you're unfamiliar with crucifixion, it's pretty much the worst form of torture you can imagine. You're, you're hung up above the ground, um, wrists and, and feet nailed uh, to, to some wood, to a tree basically. And you don't die instantaneously, you die over the course of several days. And you, you suffocate, you, you have to try to keep lifting yourselves up. As you're hanging there, people are walking by and they're mocking you and they're throwing things at you. The birds and the crows, they come by and they pick at your flesh. It's a very gruesome, terrible way to die. And the Romans would do this to say, look, this is, you want to attack the power of Rome? This is what's going to happen to you. So that's crucifixion. And so when Jesus said, I'll be lifted up, everyone was like, wait a second, if you're the Messiah, you're not supposed to die. What's, what's going on here? But there's more to that phrase than just that, because otherwise Jesus would just say, I'm going to be crucified. In the Old Testament, or in the Jewish Torah, the passage about the suffering servant that we read this morning for communion that talked about Jesus, it starts a few verses earlier. And in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, in the NIV, it says this, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And so here, we see the understanding of being lifted up as being glorified, of being honored, of, of, of getting recognition. And so, so here we see lifted up as a good thing. But then we keep reading. And we read through the passage that we read in communion this morning, and we get to Isaiah 53, verse 6, and it says, And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, if the cross reveals anything about human nature, it is this. The Son of God came to earth full of grace and truth, and we killed him. The cross exposes the depth of our depravity. And yet the moment of our greatest sinfulness, our greatest act of depravity, the killing of the Son of God, has become the means of our salvation. Jesus took our judgment upon himself. The debt that we owed for our own sin on the cross, he became the curse for us. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. His punishment has brought us peace. See, on the cross, Jesus not only suffered the worst tortures that the Romans could devise, he also carried the full weight of our sin and shame on his shoulders. Jesus faces the moment of separation between God the Father so that we no longer have to be separated from God because of our own sins. Instead, we can be brought near, we can be brought into a relationship with Jesus and with our Heavenly Father. Amen, that's right. And there's another, there's another Old Testament allusion to this idea of being lifted up. And it comes from the book of Numbers. 
And the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they began to complain against God who had, who had saved them and had been faithful. And, and, they, and, and they, they began to grumble. And so God sent judgment on them. He sent serpents and the serpents were biting people and they were dying. And so the people go to Moses, their leader, and they say, Moses, like, help us, like, like intercede to God to, to save us. And so God, and Moses goes and talks to God and he says, build a pole and make a snake on it and put it in the ground. And then everyone who's bitten by a snake, have them look at the snake and they will be healed. They won't die. In other words, look upon your judgment and be saved. And is this not what Jesus embodied on the cross? When we look upon Jesus, upon the judgment of our own sinful ways, of our own disobedience, of our own rebellion, it is then that we are saved. We are called to believe and be saved from death. And that is the final victory that Jesus won on the cross, is victory over death. In John 12, 32, the last part of that verse, into verse 33, it says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this to indicate how he was going to die. See, this is, this is a callback moment to earlier, to last week when Jesus was talking, and he said, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. See, the seed would be planted in the ground for three days before bursting forth into new life. Jesus died a real death and was buried. And there the Son of Man lay for three days. And the world experienced three days of hopelessness, three days of despair, three days of defeat, but on the third day, he rose again in bodily form, vanquishing the final enemy, death itself. The death of Jesus is paradoxically the defeat of death. And so on the cross, Jesus defeats death. Through, through his resurrection, we may now walk with him in new life. If we die with him, we will also reign with him. There's this harvest of new life that bursting forth. In 2 Corinthians 15, 54 to 55, it says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? So to recap, evil is cast out by its own schemes. Sin is crushed in its own depravity. And the final enemy, death, is swallowed up in life through death. The cross is the victory of God. And so, friends, how can we respond to, to such great glory and wisdom, such immense beauty, such overwhelming love? How can we possibly serve or follow a God that did all of that for us? Father, bring glory to your name. We respond in the words of Jesus. Father, bring glory to your name. See, this too is our mission as grateful followers of Jesus. Not to die as he died, but to live as he died. To live the cross-shaped life. Like Jesus, our glory is found in giving it away. Our life is found in laying it down. Our purpose, our mission, like the mission of Jesus is to bring glory to the Father's name. Not to ourselves, not to build our own kingdom, but to build the kingdom of heaven. So how do we do this? How do we bring glory to God's name? Well, the best place to start is in the words of Jesus himself. He says, put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. See, the call of God is to believe. But not just to believe in our heads, to accept some facts about Jesus. Not to just believe in our heart and, and get emotional and, and feel good. 
although both of those matter, but to believe with our entire lives. The call of Jesus is to hate our lives in this world so that we can live for eternity, to follow in Jesus' footsteps. I'm going to ask the band to come on up. And to close this morning, we're going to sing that song, Worthy of It All. But before, before we do, I want to lead you in a time of quiet prayer and reflective prayer. We're just going to pray those words, Father, bring glory to your name. And, and I want you to, to ask God what that looks like in your life. What does that look like this week? for Father to be glorified. Let's pray together. Father, bring glory to your name. Just ask that you would reveal to us how to bring glory to your name this week. Jesus, we're just so in awe of your love, of your grace, of your victory, that out of the greatest tragedy became the, came the greatest victory, that we can walk in new life because of your death on the cross. We are humbled and we are grateful and we're in awe of you. And so, Father, whatever it looks like this week, we say, Father, bring glory to your name. Amen.